Acts 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had, a discussion, and had discussions daily in the lecture hall, hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Amen. Oh, man, thank you, mate. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about the unstoppable... Oh, thank you very much. I'll start again. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the unstoppable mission of God. And when you hear a title like that, you might be sat there this morning thinking, I've had two coffees, I've had a bacon roll, I'm in. God's unstoppable, sign me up now. You might also be sat there and you might hear a title like that and you go, "Uh, it does feel quite stoppable if you ask me. I was in McDonald's this week with Ollie, who's our intern. He was actually on the camera this morning. And we were were looking a bit at this passage, and we were trying to understand what mission meant, what it was all about. And uh, after we'd finished uh, the pre-11 a.m. menu, which is uh, breakfast, um, after we'd finished our um, delicious McDonald's breakfast, we thought, should we try it out? Should we go and try mission? Um, And across the road, there was a shop it was like, um, you know, one of those slot machine shops uh, like with fruit machines in. And we thought, maybe if we go in there, there might be some people who might we could pray for or something like that. So we, we kind of took a big gulp and we walked across the road and we went into the shop. And uh, we walked in and a lady met us and she said, hi. And we said, hello, we're from the local church. And uh, we just... I kind of stumbled around. Uh, We just thought there might be, um, we could just come and say hello, see if there's anything that you guys might need. And she said, I need to see your ID. (laughs) And Ollie had ID, so he showed her his ID. um, And I didn't have my ID, because I haven't been ID'd for 10 years, at least. And and she said, well, what's your date of birth? And I, I told her my date of birth. And she said, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave. (laughs) Mission stoppable. (laughs) Over. (laughs) And maybe you've had a go at maybe stepping out in faith or sharing your faith or doing some kind of mission. And it's felt like it's not really happened. You've looked at the stats maybe of the church in the West and you might be tempted to think, you know what? This thing is quite stoppable. How, what do you mean unstoppable? Or maybe you're sat there this morning and you're thinking, wait, God's got a mission statement. I thought mission statements were what companies had. I, I, or, or maybe you're just thinking, uh, you know what, I'm just trying to get through the next couple, eight weeks with summer holidays and kids, and I don't really want to think about mission right now. Well, any of those categories, this talk this morning is for you. Today, what I want to talk about is, is how God's mission, that's his action, his move in the world, it, it, how it's unstoppable. I want to I try and lift the lid a little bit on what was going on in Ephesus from our reading today and think, well, what was going on there that made this mission unstoppable? And if you hear nothing else today, hear this, that God's mission to the world, his move of love towards you and towards me, It's unstoppable. He's after us. He wants us. He wants you. He's not going to stop. But at first glance, the way that he does it might appear a little bit strange. Our passage today was from Acts. We're in 
uh, the series looking at Acts chapter 19. And we heard about the Apostle Paul and his arrival and stay of two years in a city called Ephesus. Ephesus was a city in the west of modern day Turkey. Uh, It was one of the largest and most important cities in the whole of the Roman Empire at the time. It was an important place for business, for leisure, for religious interest. It was one of the kind of hot cities to go to. It's the place, one of the places to be. And you can read about this story if you go back and just have a little look at everything that goes on in, in Ephesus. It's an incredible story. It's an amazing story. But what I want to hone in on is what happens when Paul takes the believers, these people that he baptized, to the synagogue and then to this place called the Lecture Hall of Tyrannus, culminating in this this almost throwaway, blink-and-you-miss-it line that's this continued for two years until everyone, that's all the Jews and Greeks in Asia, and that means modern-day Turkey, heard the word of the Lord. What was going on that meant everyone heard about this? What was Paul doing? What was he saying? And it might be tempting to think, Well, we need to understand Paul's strategy. What did he do? How did he train people? How did he build a a team? What were what were the inner resources that he that he drew on? What were his characteristics, perhaps? What what was his um, what was his Myers Briggs personality, even? But that's that's another talk. Today, I want to understand what's going on in in the mind and in the heart of Paul. That this might happen. This amazing story might happen? What's his driving force? What moves him from one place to another? And the best reference point we have for this as Christians, for what's going on in God's mission, is the cross. For Paul, the cross is what shaped his life more than anything else. Notice at first how Paul, he moves in this gap between the synagogue. That's the place that represented God's people, God's chosen, blessed people, the best, the safest place to be. The place to go if you want to receive God's blessing would be to God's people. But he moves from there to this place called the Hall of Tyrannus, which was a Greek school of philosophy, of secular or even pagan ideas. To Paul and to the Jews, this initially would have felt like a no-go move. This wasn't what you would do if you, wanted to, to, if you wanted to be part of the mission of God. God's mission was supposed to be like with his people, in, in that only. But Paul moved to this place outside the city walls, if you like. And this, when you read through Acts, this is quite a common pattern. He goes, Paul goes from the Jews and he moves to the Gentiles. He moves God's people to those outside of who originally would have thought to be God's people. It was the pattern of his life, in fact. And, and, it's, and you can read about it in Acts 1, where Jesus says to his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which was like the holy city of God. And then Judea and Samaria, which were cast off from God's people. And then to the ends of the world. This is God's move. He moves from Jerusalem, the holy city of his people, the place that should be the pinnacle the stronghold, the holiest place, and he moves out into the world, away from the comfort and into the wild. Why? Because that's where the people are. Outside the city walls is where God does his work. And Paul, by living between the synagogue and the hall of Tyrannus, by moving from one to the other, he's being true to that mission, and he's being true to this model of the cross. And now sometimes as Christians, or maybe you've been around church a little bit, we can be tempted to think about the cross a little bit like this. Oh, the cross. I know what the cross is. That's the the thing that Jesus did. Um, He died for me to save me from my sins, and then he was resurrected, full stop, the end, and, and now I crack on. But The way Paul saw the cross was less a symbol that happened once, like a nice thing to look back on, a comfort, like a kind of guarantor almost. It it was more than that. To Paul, the cross was a model of life. 
it was a path to be followed. And in, and in Paul's life, there are a series of cross-shaped moments. And today, in your life and in my life, we have these cross-shaped moments. Moments where we move from one thing to another. Times when we move from what might seem to be safe to what seems to be not so safe. Times when it begets hard. And when, when we're in, you might be in one of those moments now. You might not need it to be named. You might know there's something tough going on in your life. And in those times, we might not die, literally die, like Jesus did on the cross. But there might be something in us that dies, something that breaks. But from that death, there's born new life. Maybe that tough time that you're in at the moment is a cross-shaped moment. And maybe God is teaching you in that moment about what he did on the cross. And on the cross, Jesus left the security of God, his holy place, his city. And he was taken out into the wild, to a place not comfortable. He was given into the hands of the Romans. They were pagan rulers. He was crucified outside the city walls as one of the lowest people. Think of the model of Jesus for your life now, who in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he gave it all up by humbling himself to death, even death on a cross. And in that, God raised him up so that the whole world, that's you and me here today, we might also be raised, might be better off, might be more complete, might be healed, could be restored, set free. So if you're in a moment like that now, a cross-shaped moment, allow God to drag you through it to the other side. Because these moments, they're what shape us. They're what make us. And I've been through these moments, and you may well have been through these moments too. They're hard, horrible even. But when we're willing to stand there and allow God to do his work in our lives, something happens, something strange. You might come out a bit more broken with scars, but you'll also come out a bit more honest, a bit more real bit more in the knowledge that you need God more than you first thought you did. And more able to witness, that's to point to his power at work in your life and in the world. And this for Paul was the model of his life. It shaped him completely. Philippians 3, Paul says this, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death on the cross, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. It was what he witnessed to while he was spending time in Ephesus too, to Christ crucified. He did it while he moved from the synagogue to the lecture hall. He did it in those spaces. And he did it with his words. It was what he was all about. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says this, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom or eloquence, lest the cross of Christ, that is the gospel, be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. God. And this message of the cross from life to death to life again was Paul's message to the Ephesian church. It's recorded in, in his letter to the Ephesians called Ephesians. And he says this, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins in which you used to live. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. The life of the cross is there from life to death to life again. And out of this model of the cross, it was how Paul and the early church witnessed to God's power. And it was the message that went all around the region. Did you know the early church's depiction of Jesus on a cross? They would often have Jesus 
on the cross. Today, we might think about having an empty cross. Often lots of our churches have empty crosses in. But in the early church, they had Jesus on the cross. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Their God on a cross. This is the picture that the early church would have held out as a visible sign of God's power. The King of Kings, their Savior, put to death on a cross. Strange, perhaps, to do. But Jesus on the cross was the witness. And on first glance, to look at the picture of Jesus on the cross, it looks like this mission has stopped. The cross was the instrument the Romans used to stop criminals, terrorists, threats to the state. It was the symbol they used to show everyone else that if they tried something, they'd be stopped. They used to line uh, main roads with people being crucified to make a point so that people wouldn't try anything. But Christians believe that Jesus, although he died on a cross, God dragged him out from death to life. Ultimately, that's true for us one day. Even though we will all die, we will be raised with Christ. But it's also true for those mini cross-shaped moments in your life. And it's true for God's mission in the world too, his move in the world. So if mission looks stoppable, the decline of the church or the tearing apart of the social fabric in the West. Or maybe, maybe it's just your efforts to try and witness to Jesus on a day-to-day basis. If they, if, they, if they feel like they're not getting the traction you want, if they feel stoppable, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Because as our efforts die, God will drag them through. Maybe even as the church seems to die, God will drag her through and will raise her up. That is the pattern that God works in. One of my heroes is a man called Hudson Taylor. And Hudson Taylor uh, was a missionary. Uh, He was from uh, the north of England. And he was instrumental in raising a generation of missionaries that were sent to China. He sent thousands in the 1800s to China. But on the face of it, it didn't look like those missionaries had as big an impact as perhaps they would have wanted. Uh, Towards the end of Hudson Taylor's life, there was something called the Boxer Revolution. And and thousands of the missionaries that he'd raised up and sent to China, they were either killed at the hands of the state or they were kicked out of China. Uh, And then later, there was uh, more persecution for the church. And it seemed as if the church was dead and buried, stopped. But in that dead place, that is where God works. And today, China is the biggest Christian nation on the planet. And it's grown faster over the last four decades than anywhere. The church has grown faster over the last four decades than anywhere else on the planet. And maybe you're here today and you're thinking, oh, you know what, God? I feel like I'm in a dead place in my life and my play and my part in this mission of yours God is I don't know if I can do it I don't know if I've if I've got it what it takes allow the Lord today to work in you in that cross-shaped moment that you're in allow him to drag you through because his mission is towards you it's to make you whole in him to heal you in him And it might pinch, but God operates through a cross. And to see Jesus on the cross, that is what the world needs today. So for you, though you might have momentary struggles, they are achieving for you and for others a glory that far outweighs them all. So... How did the whole of Asia, that's, my, that's Turkey, modern day Turkey, hear the word of the Lord? Was it Paul's grand plan? Was it his efforts? Was it his strategic mind, his, his, his missional thinker persona? Was it his skills as a practitioner? Maybe that helped, but it wasn't the main thing. You see, Paul, 
he inhabited this space. He moved from the security of the world and witnessed to Jesus Christ on the cross. And, and in that, other people saw and they witnessed to Jesus on the cross. And they went on their travels, witnessing to Jesus on the cross. The message of the cross impacted that city at that time. And everyone heard about what was going on. And so wherever you are today, in this building probably, or joining online, you might be going home to be with the kids, or maybe it's work tomorrow, or hanging out with your friends. You can witness to Jesus on the cross too. Can you imagine what it might look like if we all saw that this was about Jesus Christ on a cross, dying for the whole world? This mission, God's move to the world, it's not through eloquence, it's not through the best brand or the best event, it's through a community of people who embrace God's unstoppable mission towards the world in Christ for their lives too. Shall we stand and we're going to pray? And just wherever you are now, you might feel like you're in a, a tough time. Try and frame it with the cross. You might want to close your eyes. And just think about that thing that's going on. And in, just in your mind's eye, overlay that experience with a picture of Jesus Christ on a cross. And whatever it is that's in you that you know needs to be put to death or you know needs to go. Think about Jesus on the cross for that thing.